chance to watch that afterwards. For those, how do you get to the recording website? Uh, they're on uh, my YouTube page, and then I'll post them on our Facebook page. Usually, sometime the next day, we've got to adjust it from Zoom and get it where it can be out. Well, good evening, Stacy. How are you doing? Um, we're about ready to get uh, started then. We'll begin with a, a prayer and then jump into, we've got a handful of uh, good questions here to get some discussion started. And then we'll be on page 30 uh, in our book and to pick up. We pray. Heavenly Father, we praise and thank you for the day that you've given to us. We ask you to watch over us uh, this evening with uh, the weather that is coming in. Uh, keep your people safe. Uh, allow us to, to all uh, make it home uh, and to, to be safe throughout the night. And we ask you to be uh, with us during our class today. Give us the full measure of your Holy Spirit. We might rejoice in the wonderful messages uh, that you have for us in Holy Scripture. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So we haven't had class in a couple of weeks. Uh, so I don't know if you even remember writing down some of these questions, but we'll see. Um, I remembered where they were um, and I found them. Uh, it took me a minute this morning, but I found them all. Uh, the first question is, when we see Jesus in heaven, will he have his human body with holes in his hands and feet? It's a yes or no question, what do you think? Yes. Hear a yes. I would say no because we're supposed to be returned to <clears throat> like healthy or whatever. We're supposed to be. So we got a yes and we got a no. Um, so we do hear about a glorified body. Uh, we'll hear this uh, coming Sunday about all tears being wiped away, no more hunger or thirst or crying or mourning or pain. Uh, we won't be able to be hurt. But here's this striking thing. That when Jesus rises from the grave uh, and he shows them his hands and his feet, and there's those scars. Uh, there's also this striking thing in Revelation where Jesus is pictured as a lamb. But what kind of a lamb? Do you remember? A lamb, a lamb who was slain. So when John sees him, he says he looks like a lamb who was slain. Uh, so he's marked, he's he's alive, but he's one who's dead. So very much like on Easter evening when he shows his hands, his side, his feet. The following uh, Sunday, he does that uh, for Thomas uh, too. Right? So it, it seems that uh, that will still be the case. Um, now, uh, aside from his wounds, uh, his humanity uh, is the other question. Will he discard his humanity? Will he be done with it? What do you think? No. When, when he rises from the grave, he still has it. When the apostles talk about him, uh, they don't talk about him as, uh, the, like, the, there's one mediator between man and, and God, the one who used to be a man, Jesus Christ. No, the man, Jesus Christ. And then in Revelation, again, he's pictured as the lamb, uh, which is a callback to John chapter one. So John writes Revelation. He also writes uh, the gospel. And in John chapter one, uh, what does John the baptizer call Jesus? Look, the lamb. Um, so not a spirit, but one who can be slain. Uh, so there's nothing in scripture that shows him uh, ever discarding his humanity, which is such an honor for us. That he comes down and humbles himself and empties himself and takes on our humanity and then even goes further down becoming our sin and humbling himself to the point of death. And then he comes up alive and he doesn't leave humanity behind he's raising us up along with him it's an incredible honor that our god 
the second person of the Holy Trinity, will be true man for forever. And he's got those scars. Now, the question, uh, you know, when in heaven, there's usually like, I'm, I'm not entirely sure, you know, um, but it seems from, from scripture that he still will have his scars. And some have taken that and said, well, the, the saints, uh, those who are martyred, probably have their scars too. Uh, that, for instance, when we see Stephen, who was stoned to death, then maybe we'll see some indentations or some scars. Um, Christian uh, artists uh, have even, going back through the centuries, uh, there's pictures of the saints in heaven and those who were beheaded just holding their head. There's John the Baptizer. His, he got his hand and said, yeah, I know. <laughs> John the Baptizer just holding it. And, you know, uh, I don't I. I, I don't know exactly, but the, one of the hymns that we sing in Advent, we talk about the glorious scars of Jesus. And if we are those who are counted as worthy of joining in his suffering, uh, then those might be considered glorious scars uh, as well. And perhaps... It won't be that we are, you know, airbrushed models in heaven, but that we'll have something better, which might be our scars. There, I'm a little, a little less, you know, what, what about our bodies? But it sure seems like with Jesus, those scars will be there. Uh, another question that we had from a couple, few weeks ago. Uh, so if Mary is the mother of God, where does her sin come into the equation? So we say in the uh, book of Concord that Mary properly and rightly is called the mother of God because Jesus is God. It's not about speaking too highly of her. It's about speaking properly of him. Uh, and his two natures can't be ripped apart. If they are ripped apart, and some have in their teaching, and they also teach, well, God didn't really suffer on the cross. But if he didn't suffer on the cross, we have no. So it must, we must be able to say that that baby is God, that that dying man on the cross is God, uh, that therefore Mary is the mother of God, even though she's after him. We're speaking properly about him, not too highly about her. But what about her sin? Uh, the Roman Catholic Church goes to the point of saying, well, Mary was conceived different. There's an immaculate conception for her uh, so that she is conceived without sin, so that her body is not tainted by sin, and therefore uh, the body of Jesus would not be tainted by sin. There's nothing like that in scripture at all. That would be speaking too highly of her. Now, what we do see from scripture is that we inherit sin from, from who? Just had this lesson in catechism class uh, last night uh, over Zoom. And we typically will say we inherit sin from our parents. But is that what scripture says? That we inherit our sin from our parents. We'll read a passage later and talking about pastors uh, and why we don't have female pastors. You know, where Paul says that the woman was deceived. You know, that's part of the reason. But usually when the New Testament talks about who sinned uh, and where our sin comes from, it's not that we inherit our sin from Eve ever, right? Adam. We inherit our sin from Adam. Uh, we don't talk about it, uh, our old sinful nature, as the old Eve, but the old Adam. Um, I don't think it's going too far, pressing the matter too far, uh, to say that um, our sin doesn't come from mom, but from dad. Uh, Adam sinned. And therefore, all of us are sinful. Even though we do say in the New Testament and the Old, 
Eve is the one who started it. But where do we inherit it from? From Adam. Uh, who gets circumcised in the Old Testament? Baby boys or baby girls? There is female circumcision, but not in our faith. Um, so it, it seems that this, I, I mean, this flesh gives birth to flesh, Jesus says in John chapter 3. Uh, the circumcision of male. Uh, and uh, that we have uh, our sin inherited not from Eve, even though she sinned first, she became the transgressor. But we inherited from Adam. Uh, that, that Mary is allowed to be a sinner, which fits with scripture, and not pass on sin. It's not being flesh gives birth to flesh. Right? You go to John chapter 1. Um, he's not conceived by the power of a a man, right? Um, he's born of the virgin, uh, is conceived there within her womb. But he, John in John chapter one specifies that it's not by the power of a man that Jesus is conceived. Again and again throughout scripture, uh, you have this, uh, this sort of thing there uh, that Mary as a woman uh, is not passing on her sin. So wives, you are allowed to blame your husbands for your children's faults. I think it's okay. Does that bring up any thoughts? We got a couple other questions here. Okay. Another question, Martin Luther uh, breaks with the Catholic Church. Uh, why is there a loss of reverence toward the Virgin Mary uh, that the Catholic Church retains? So I, I think a lot of, of that is tied to what we, what we just talked about. Um, we uh, do not speak too highly of Mary. We want to speak properly of her. But we have maybe overcorrected, I think, seeing some of the Marian cults uh, that the, one of the popes last century even called Mary the co-redemptrix. So Jesus is our redeemer and Mary is our redeemer. That's too far. Um, to, uh, in uh, Latin American uh, Roman Catholic churches, very often there's this idea that you, you pray to Mary because Jesus is kind of scary. And if you get in good with mom, maybe that's the best way to get to Jesus, which is, that's not the Jesus that we have in the scriptures. You know, we pray in his name to his father. Um, you know, he invites us to come to him. He's not going to turn us away. And so there's some false teaching there about Mary that we do want to stay away from, but maybe we've overcorrected to the point where we haven't uh, done what the scriptures say, that all generations will call her blessed. Uh, and I think right now in the uh, history of the world where we're at, where uh, there has been such a, an attack on what is feminine, uh, that now uh, the, the world is probably going to start overcorrecting. Uh, and uh, I think that kind of sets things up for the cult of Mary to get to be kind of a big thing in this coming century. Things are crazy with gender stuff right now. And now well, well, the, the anti-feminine uh, ideas that have been out there are starting to, to be shown to be what they are. And so you can see the, you know, I'd like to talk about the future, but I can see the devil saying, okay, um, well, here you go. Start praying to Mary. Uh, and that growing. And there have been a number of uh, videos that I've watched of former Protestants who have become Roman Catholic and have really kind of expressed that. Uh, they, they've seen uh, such a downplaying of, uh, of what is feminine, of motherhood, uh, of uh, things like that, 
uh, that they see, well, here's this, here's Mother Mary. Uh, and all of the things that I had heard in my Protestant church um, were usually like myths sort of things and overreactions that they just, okay, now I'm, now I'm using the rosary and I'm praying to Mary every day. Um, so I think to our uh, detriment, you know, we maybe have overcorrected from the Roman Catholic errors of speaking too highly of her into just like, let's not talk about her. We should talk about her. We should talk about motherhood. We should talk about virginity. All of these things are in scripture right? and we should talk about them properly and maybe more often than we do. So mea culpa, Nat, we need to get better. Thoughts on that? The next one is a different topic. So, all right. Our final one, uh, where did uh, confession originally come from? At our last class, we talked about private confession. Um, where did it originally come from? Well, I would say from uh, Jesus' uh, own mouth on Easter evening. Uh, whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven. You know, he wants us to be doing this. Uh, and in James, in his letter, uh, he says, confess your sins to one another. Uh, now, very early on in the Christian church, you, know, you have this kind of formalized. Uh, well, how do you do that? How do you confess your sins to one another? It can happen in a very informal way. And we want that to happen uh, uh, amongst you, uh, that you, when you say to each other, I made this mistake, that the other person doesn't say, oh, yeah, me too, uh, and says nothing about Jesus and the forgiveness of sins. Like, confess your sins to one another and then say, Jesus died for that. Like, you're forgiven. You're baptized. You know, speak the gospel. Uh, you're allowed to do that. If you forgive the sins of anyone, they are forgiven. So don't miss a chance to speak that forgiveness uh, by just saying, well, yeah, I make that, that mistake too. Everyone makes that mistake. Those are true things. They have their place. But it's not the gospel. It doesn't absolve. It doesn't forgive. If you say, I forgive you in the name of Jesus, it is as powerful and effective as if Jesus himself, with his wounds in his hands, uh, says, I forgive you your sins. You know, he's handed over such a remarkable thing, an authority to the church. that you get to say, I forgive you. Um, but since we don't always trust that someone else is going to like not blab <laughs> what we've said to them, um, it can be a helpful thing to know that there's, you've got a pastor who has sworn to God that he's not going to divulge the sins of anyone who confesses to him. And even our court system will protect me as a pastor uh, that I don't have to, I can't break that confessional seal. Uh, and there is something comforting to be able to say, well, let's walk through just the order, which I got to do uh, last week at our conference. I got to go to my pastor uh, and confess my sin, go through that and say the uh, sins of grievous thought, word, and deed, and say that out loud. And he doesn't get to tell anyone else because his ear is a graveyard. Your sins go to die. His mouth uh, at that time is just the mouth of the Lord Jesus you know, saying, I forgive you. Uh, and that's, it's a tremendous gift. Uh, and it's something I, as I mentioned in our last class, I love it for myself. Uh, and I, I know what it's like to walk around feeling guilt and shame uh, and it just nagging at you. And I don't, I don't want that for you. So whether you would come to me a formal way or come to me in an informal way, whether you would go to each other in an informal way, just don't let uh, it be like David who said, when I kept silent, my, my bones wasted away. So we're all about the forgiveness of sins at church. 
Um, let that be the main thing in your conversation with each other. Let that be the main thing in uh, our relationship as pastor to a parishioner. I want you to hear this good news. Uh, yes, even for that sin. Let's forget it. Okay. Um, Martin Luther uh, wrote a beautiful little thing called a brief exhortation to confession. Uh, and in our uh, book of Concord, there's a number of places uh, elsewhere within there that where we say, uh, it's not our goal to get in the Reformation. It's not our goal to get rid of private confession and absolution, but to get rid of the stuff in private confession in the Roman church that covers up the gospel uh, and removes the comfort uh, that that is there. Uh, the Reformation, which tomorrow is the 31st in celebration of, of that. Now, the Reformation, I, you can say, was mostly about cleaning up the confessional booth so that broken sinners can hear, I forgive you all your sins. And that was uh, at the core of, uh, of the, the Reformation, uh, not a getting rid of the confessional booth but purifying it from the things that hid the, the comfort of, of forgiveness. Okay, with that then, let's go to page 30. Uh, holy branches that bear and proclaim the Holy Cross. In John chapter 15, Jesus says, I am the true vine, vine and my father is the gardener. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he is going to cut off. And he prunes every branch that does bear fruit so that it will bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me and I am going to remain in you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Likewise, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine. You are the branches. The one who remains in me and I in him is the one who bears much fruit because without me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not remain in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. So branches are gathered, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. My father is glorified by this, that you continue to bear much fruit and prove to be my disciples. Now, this is uh, pictured for us on the cover, uh, too, that uh, he is the, the vine, we are the branches, we are connected to him and bear much fruit uh, by being connected to him. It has to start with him uh, so that uh, the way that he loves us first is the way that we also will love others. And that bearing of fruit is not for the branch, right? Branches don't eat grapes. Someone else gets to. Uh, for us, uh, this love, everything J Jesus did in love for us was not for him, right? It's for us. And what he did for us is enough for us so that I can give to another. This is the way of the cross, uh, that we be that we live as theologians of the cross is that we are uh, bearing the cross, denying self, that we are humbling self, uh, that we are those who are last, that we are those who are servants. Some of the passages there on page 30 say, uh, so that our fruit is always for the good of another. The way of glory is disconnected from Christ on the cross, and anything that I'm doing for another is really for my own glory. Uh, that if I'm uh, working uh, for uh, my boss, uh, it's, it's not for his good. I'm not concerned about that. I'm only concerned about a paycheck. Okay? And if I'm... Uh, Raising up children, it's so that they can be little trophies and I can show them off. Uh, and so it, whether or not they get an A on their report card, it's really about me and not so much about them. Um, and if they behave uh, well, 
then I get to put puff out my chest. And if they misbehave, then I get to bash them because, you know, what the world, what is the world thinking about me because of you, you know? It's all really about me. It's not for them and for their good. And so I lose patience with them a little bit more easily. So I, and I get angry with them and I get jealous of other people uh, because everything is really about me and my glory. Whereas if Christ is the one who's shamed on the cross and I'm bearing uh, my cross and following him and doing things for the good of another, then if they don't thank me and there's no return, well, that's okay. If they didn't notice and appreciate what I did, well, that's okay. That's all right. I don't have to be jealous or angry or anything like that. You see on the top of page uh, 31, uh, a difference between uh, the uh, works of the sinful nature, verse 19 in Galatians 5, starting there, and then the fruit of the Spirit, starting at verse 22. Uh, you can see uh, sexual immorality, impurity, a complete lack of restraint, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, discord, jealousy, outbursts of anger, all of these things fit in with this mode uh, where I'm self-centered, where my life, I'm the center of everything for me. Uh, and other people are either an object, uh, that a uh, tool for my own glory, uh, or they are someone who's getting in the way. You know, and as long as they're playing my game, I'll keep them around. But as soon as they don't, um, then I'll throw a fit and I'll throw them out. Whereas the fruits of the spirit, even if this person is not doing what they're supposed to, and instead they're acting as my enemy, what do I get to do with an enemy? What does Jesus say to your enemies? Love your, love your enemies. So whether they're doing what they're supposed to or not, uh, I can remain in the producing these fruits of the spirit, starting at verse 22 on page 31, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. None of those can be hindered by the other person. But if this is my mode, then the other person can always hinder my goal. My goal is to be like Christ. The other person can never get in the way of that. It can never stop love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, self-control. Um, in fact, the other person can possibly always benefit from those fruits, which is what I want. I want them to be welcomed into joy. I want them to receive love. I want them to see someone who is patient uh, and uh, benefit from that. And if that person is a fellow Christian, they'll recognize, oh, I see where this is coming from. And if that person is not a fellow Christian, they will ask, well, why aren't you like everyone else? And then you can give a reason for the hope that you have. So this is the living, fruitful way that starts with the cross, love, patience, uh, uh, joy, faith, uh, gentleness, kindness, self-control. But this is the way of the world uh, where I'm working towards my glory. And when you're in your 20s and 30s, you know, maybe it seems like this works out. Uh, but after that, um, boy, you have to have won a whole lot. Just think like this will still keep working. Uh, or you have to uh, convince yourself that maybe the next time, the next time uh, I'm going to win enough uh, where I end up on top. Uh, and you start after your 30s and 40s, kind of go in one of two ways. If you're a theologian of glory, either you're winning and you start writing books about how uh, this is the way to go, or you're just miserable all of the time. Uh, and complaining, uh, and you kind of cut yourself off from other people and get turned in, and it gets pretty uncomfortable. But here, if my goal is to be like Christ, no one can get in the way. 
the fruits of the spirit. They may not appreciate it. They might trample on you and attack you. Well, that's okay. That happened to him. And if being like him is the goal, then I can always be fruitful. No one can get in my way of that. Um, so are we turned in on self or turned out towards towards the, the other? Uh, you see this in the, uh, the these three commandments that we have on page 31, the second, the seventh, and the eighth. Uh, there's these two directions uh, that we could go. With the second commandment, you shall not misuse the name of the Lord your God. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not use his name to curse, swear, lie, or deceive, or use witchcraft. All of the kinds of things that I might be tempted to do if my glory is the main thing. Like I might be tempted to get into witchcraft sort of stuff. If I'm only looking for my good here and now, my pleasure, my glory in this life. Uh, let's find some crystals. Uh, let's do some spells. Um, there's people who are doing that. I met a witch next door. Um, uh, and she interesting stuff and it sucks people in right um because i'm thinking about my glory but if i'm thinking about his cross i don't need no witchcraft no need that um call upon god's name in every trouble pray praise and give thanks well no one can get in my way of calling upon his name in every trouble praying praising and giving thanks totally free to do that the seventh commandment, you shall not steal. We should fear and love God that we do not take our neighbor's money or property or get it by dishonest dealing. If my glory is the main thing, uh, then my neighbor's stuff might be a good way to get my glory, right? But uh, help him to improve and protect his property and means of income. So his stuff is something that I get to help him with. And I get to be excited about helping him with it uh, and not think that he's in my way uh, of me getting more of my own stuff. Uh, he's not in competition with me. No other human being was created by God uh, for you to compete with financially or, you know, who's got the bigger boat or whatever. All of that is a waste of time, that kind of competition life. Um, you get to help him with his getting an, an even bigger boat while you uh, still don't even have a, a, a little rowboat with a hole in it, you know? That's fine. You get to help him. That's freedom. No one can get, get in the way of that. The eighth command, you shall not give false testimony against your neighbor. What does this mean? We should fear and love God that we do not tell lies about our neighbor, betray him, or give him a bad name. Which, if my glory is the big thing, it's going to be pretty easy to do all of those things or to want to do all of those things or to see that, you know, it, it would it would be really helpful if my boss heard uh, that this coworker showed up late again. Maybe I'll find some way to just drop that in. Uh, because we're both up for the same, you know, job, uh, whatever. But... Uh, defend him, speak well of him, and take his words and actions in the kindest possible way. That I'm not concerned about getting anything out of my relationship with him. I've gotten everything I need from Christ. And so now what do I get to do good for him? And notice it's not, not because he's someone who's been good to me. It's not just for uh, the, the people that I like. Um, this is, imagine in every case, that we've talked about that this guy is actually your enemy and has acted as your enemy. Uh, this is what we're supposed to do. Love your enemy. Uh, defend him, speak well of him, take his words and actions kindest possible way, which none of us have done, right? But Christ has. And through faith in him, his righteousness is your righteousness, uh, which is the message that we want to hear from Whoever would be speaking for God to us, like your pastor, which is the next page. 
Any questions on pages uh, 30 and 31 as we start to turn to 32 and 33 and shift towards away from our life of producing fruit and towards this relationship of pastor to parish. I'll let you think on that a little bit more while I erase and readjust here. Right, so on this next page, Romans chapter 10 uh, is this whole section. There's uh, here in Romans 10, Paul quotes from the Old Testament a whole bunch. So you see a, a lot of references in there, but this is all Romans 10 like here. Yes, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So then, how can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one about whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? And how can they preach unless they are sent? Just as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news of peace, who preach the gospel of good things. But not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah says, Lord, who has believed our message? So then faith comes from hearing the message, and the message comes through the word of Christ. <clears throat> Stop there. Two things I want to highlight. Uh, first is the necessity, in a sense, of having a preacher. Uh, God sends preachers. Uh, whether they're called and ordained uh, in a formal way, uh, like a pastor, whether they're uh, called like Jeremiah, uh, to be a, a prophet in the Old Testament, whether they're apostles uh, who could perform miracles uh, like those in the very early uh, time uh, uh, of, the, of the church, or it's mom and dad, friend. Like you get to speak this good news to other people. This is what God has set up, that he who spoke the word will speak it through us to us which is a remarkable thing that he would uh, you know, give us this honor to take part in how he brings his salvation about to his people. Uh, that, that, as, that as a mom, you get to teach your kids to pray to the Father in the name of the Son. And that you get to read the Bible uh, in the morning, in the evening. Uh, that as friends, you get to, to talk about this uh, with each other. That you get to uh, say to your buddy, hey, why don't you come over uh, and just, just check it out. One, just do one class. Mm -hmm. uh, that God would give us the honor of being part of him sending out his good message of the gospel uh, to those who haven't heard it yet. Pretty remarkable thing. But it's, it's what he has chosen to do, uh, that he chooses to work through foolish human beings uh, as preachers uh, to proclaim the good news, uh, to proclaim this word of Christ. Now, there are those who are uh, in official capacities as uh, preachers. Uh, and that's what he's talking about in Matthew chapter 7, where he gives a warning. Watch out for false prophets. They come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. So here he's not necessarily talking about your, um, your buddy at work uh, who's got some cockamamie ideas uh, about what's going to happen at the end of the world, um, but he's not called to be a preacher. Here he's talking about those who would seem to be those that have been called by God to officially and publicly proclaim his word. And he says, watch out. There are these sheeps, uh, these wolves in sheep's clothing uh, that are ravenous wolves. Uh, and their false message is incredibly dangerous. So let's do a little bit of drawing again. It's a similar thing as we just had. 
there are uh, those who are humble creatures of the word of God, and they just want to hand over to you what they themselves have received from Christ in scripture and sacrament, so that you put all of your faith uh, and hope in Christ. It's nice and simple. Jesus died for you. You know, this is what baptism is for you. This is why you can uh, always come back to your baptism. Here is what he means by this is my body. Guess what he means by this is my body? He means this is my body. Guess what he means by this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins? That this is really going to forgive your sins. You know, this is awesome. So this is what a, a faithful preacher is doing, just handing over the goods so that you have all hope and comfort in Christ. That's the theologian of the cross who's a preacher. Now, the theologian of glory who's a preacher, who's a, a, a wolf in sheep's clothing, again, it's going to go the way of glory. Uh, he might say some things uh, about this, but he puts himself above it. Right? He's not humble and beneath it and submitting to it. He puts himself above it. He will pick and choose uh, what he wants, whatever he thinks, so that he can get out of you what he wants for himself. Um, he will only pick and choose, and his goal is not you in Christ and you having all your hope in Christ. He will make use of the word of God, abusing it, and then also uh, make use of you abusing you, taking what he wants, just a little bit from it, and just a little bit from you, uh, whether it's you know just getting into uh, your wallet uh, so that he has a huge mansion in Texas, Joel Osteen, uh, or, or Creflo Dollar, um, yeah, apropos name. You just keep that. Yeah. You, you say He's a black preacher. Big, big, yeah. He needed a six million dollar airplane oh, to, for his ministry to get up from Atlanta to New York because it's just you know, it's too tough. Um, monstrous. Uh, sometimes it's easy to see, or should be easy to see. Well, the next but there's line, a lot of people that are there. The next line there, and then it says, by their fruits, you will know them. So there's going to be something that you can recognize in their fruits. So what's the what's going to be the fruit of a preacher? What he says. Now, is he, uh, Paul summarizes uh, the, the gospel message uh, with, what is it? Four words, four words. Can you finish this for me? Christ crucified. Christ crucified. This is how he summarizes the message. We preach Christ crucified. Um, is that what you're hearing from a Joel Osteen, a, a Creflo Dollar, a Kenneth Copeland? Um, uh, I've tried to find it. It's not really there. Um but then when you listen to them, you also see, oh, boy, I can see why, like, if I hadn't, if I hadn't been taught properly, like, I would be all in. I mean, it sells. And there's a reason that asking for a $6 million jet actually ends up with him getting a $6 million jet. Because we love it. This makes sense to us by nature. The old Adam, not the old Eve, but the old Adam loves this kind of stuff. Um, but those are wolves, ravenous wolves. Uh, Rachel and I, on our first uh, anniversary, we went up into uh, North Georgia mountains and uh, we found a, a little breakfast place and there's a TV in the corner. And the preacher that Saturday morning was talking about your... Um, your seed money and was promising that if you put in a thousand dollars, here's the phone number, and you know, we accept these of my thousand dollars. 
uh, I think it was like within three months, you'll get 10,000. And who's listening to that? And who's sending in money? I mean, it's happening and it's awful. Uh, Paul talks about uh, those who uh, weasel their way into widows' houses and destroy those houses. And that, that's what was happening. And that they had that on the television instead of a cartoon or something, you know, that uh, awful stuff. And it's not about Christ and him crucified. It's not about handing over the goods. It's not about saying to the, the uh, guilty, uh, you're forgiven. Uh, to those who are ashamed to say, look at the, uh, the, the robe of Christ that, that covers you. Um, it's not about giving hope uh, for eternal life. It's not we preach Christ crucified. It's whatever is going to be profitable in the moment, whether financially or some other uh, way. Um, and the devil loves this kind of stuff. He loves to masquerade as an angel of light. And he does most of his work in churches, not outside of churches. So what do we expect from a preacher? Uh, what does a preacher do? Uh, is a preacher supposed to do? Paul in 1 Timothy chapter 2 and leading into chapter 3 uh, talks about that. So I'm going to um, I'm going to read and then I'm going to erase some things up here and do something else. On the bottom of page 32. Therefore, I want a man in every place to pray, lifting up holy hands without anger or argument. Likewise, I also want women to adorn themselves with respectable clothing, with modesty, self-control, not with braided hair, gold, pearls, or expensive clothes, but with what is proper for women who profess godliness, with good works. A woman should learn in a quiet manner with full submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. Instead, she is to continue in a quiet manner. Adam was formed first, then Eve. And it was not Adam who was deceived, but it was the woman who was deceived and became a transgressor. But she will be saved while bearing children if they remain in faith and love and sanctification with self-control. This saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to become an overseer, he desires a noble task. So overseer here, think pastor. It is necessary then for the overseer to be above reproach, the husband of only one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not a violent man, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. It is necessary that he manage his own household well with all dignity, making sure that his children obey. If a man does not know how to manage his own household, how will he take care of God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he might become conceited and fall into the same condemnation as the devil. In addition, he must have a good reputation with those outside the church so that he may not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. All right. So we're going to have two columns up here. Pastor is and is not. So what would you put and tell me which side you put it, whatever comes to mind. Pastor is and a pastor is not. He's gentle. Gentle? Violent. Not violent. Those two kind of go together. better have the other fruit of the Holy Spirit, too. So you better have self-control and patience and all that kind of So you're going to want the fruits of the Spirit. Uh, if that's expected, of, if that's something that the Holy Spirit wants to do in all of God's people, you would want to see that in the pastor. Um, Paul says, you imitate me as I imitate Christ. So every pastor should be able to be living a life that you should be able to imitate something of it. When it comes to the fruits of the spirit. Able to teach. Teaching is 
key part of this. Drunkard, so going with the fruit of self control there. Not wanting six million dollar kid. <laughs> so that would be not a lover of money. Not a lover of money. You know, uh, instead, uh, you know, Luther's seal to cross on the heart, money on the heart. What about something controversial? For the most part, all I think even um, people who are not Christians would say, well, you would want your pastor to be more like this. Okay. Husband of one wife. Uh, so the one wife part, a little less controversial, but the idea that he's a husband, not a wife. Yeah. Not a woman. Oh, uh, the idea that he's married. Okay. So, so there... Um, we would be able to say from scripture, since Paul didn't get married, uh, that it's not that he has to be a husband, uh, but when he's saying husband of one wife, as opposed to husband of multiple wives, rather than husband as opposed to not a husband, since Paul uh, does does speak highly of uh, celibacy uh, for the ministry. Um, but here a little more controversial he's not a he's not he's a he he's not a she let's pause he's very and he, he. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so let's pause on those uh because uh, those are the sorts of things that uh, maybe right now uh, everyone overlooks us for teaching this sort of thing uh, but if the, the the right person is angry about uh, this and uh, stumbles on uh, websites or uh, things that we have, outrage, right? Have you Should we that? just stop and change? Have you experienced? And you get some things on some comments online you know, from mean, time to time, with, but nothing. Uh, I don't know how many people. We're reaching with your little reels or whatever. I mean, about the gender and the body and the physical and the spiritual. And I mean, have you had any feedback? I, not a whole lot. There's some, uh, but there, we're not reaching a whole lot. Well, you know, <laughs> um, so yeah, you know? yeah, I've, but no, not not a whole lot. Um, Times have changed, right? But there are new Should we change? There that do say that's okay, the Elka. Yeah. And then when people see you, they're like, oh, why are you mm -hmm. part of that group? Yeah. I'll try to be specific when mm -hmm. I say Lutheran. <laughs> so they, there are Lutherans uh, who. Husband of one husband, uh, you know, wife of one husband, wife of one wife, uh, all of that would be fine. Um, and our teaching, and and our teaching, yeah. There's a book I have um, that uh, it, in the back there was some uh, random sermons uh, on the the topic, and the book is fantastic. And the uh, one sermon from the woman preacher was great. I mean, she's able to teach, and she was preaching Christ and Him crucified. And was, but Paul says no, right? And th there's someone like that that you know, everything that she's saying, except that she's the one saying it. Like she's preaching better. I'm, I want to take that. Sermon. I wish I would have written that. But she's not supposed to. No. Is that because she's not capable? When no. Yeah. People were exercising demons and 
the apostles were mad at it about it. Jesus says that's okay. They're doing it my name, even though they're not authorized to do it. Well, there it's it's not so much that they're not authorized uh, to do it, um, but uh, but that that is a that is a key point. Um, and thinking about this, um, they, there are plenty of uh, female preachers who are preaching the gospel, and God be praised uh, that that word works, uh, even though say that's not the order that God has set up. Um, and with the uh, casting out of demons uh, there, uh, God had not really set up a, well, these people are not supposed to. So there, there's a bit of a difference there. Uh, here, Paul has said, do not permit a woman to teach. I mean, um, and so it's, it's just there. Um, but that sermon that I read from this lady Great stuff. Uh, and the Holy Spirit works through that. Uh, and we can thank God for that. Uh, just like sometimes the Pope even says some really good stuff. Um, and yeah, all right, that was a good, that was a good one. Um, this current Pope doesn't say many of those. Um, it's usually all over the place. But now, is this about um, oppression of women? And is this about saying that women are un, are not capable? Does Paul say women are not good at this sort of thing? Well, let's leave this work to men. He didn't say that. Well, at that time, during Paul's time, weren't there women that held high uh, standings in society? So I don't... So it's not like he was looking at society and being like, okay, all women are downgraded, and so this is what I'm going to put the word. And I built, they held high uh, positions at that time. Especially in, uh, <clears throat> in religions. So this is a rare thing. They're sticking out like a sore thumb for not having priestesses. You're probably going to have more priestesses than priests uh, among the Roman uh, pantheon of gods. Um, this is not, well, Paul was just a, um, you know, a product of his time uh, and women have been uh, uh, you know, always uh, oppressed. Uh, and so he's just following along with the culture. This is standing out as different here uh, because you go to the, uh, the pantheon of gods uh, and the pantheon of goddesses and there's priests and there's priestesses right? and there it's not about being a, a child of his or a product of his time and his culture uh, so much of the things that Paul says are ste stepping outside of the norm like with homosexuality I mean, the Greeks and the Romans. Julius Caesar was, you know, every woman wanted to be with him, but he wanted to be with every boy. You know, this is just like homosexuality was not a rare thing and wasn't even all that looked down on. Um, in the, which emperor was it that had his own fantasy island and everyone knew about it? Uh, and it was, it was boys. That were brought to the fantasy island more than girls. Like homosexuality was not something that was looked down upon entirely at that time. So that when Paul writes in Romans 1 against homosexuality, he's not a product of his time. And that, you know, here and then since the 1960s, we just finally figured it out. I mean, this is this is wisdom from above. Now, when Paul uh, does say that women can't be pastors, um, and he says that women should, should, should learn in quiet submission, um, is silence bad? Is submission bad? Well, 
that it is a stray. Yeah. Um, silence is good, and throughout Scripture, everyone's invited into it. Submission is good, and throughout Scripture, everyone is invited into it. And thinking about what uh, women are called to do here in this section is all stuff that ends up being strength when it comes to our faith in Christ. Um, that and how do we know that this is not just his opinion? Because you said in some sections that it, you could clearly differentiate what was coming from him versus what was coming from God. Yeah, there are times like uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians says, he, he clearly says again and again, I, not the Lord. And, and then he'll say, this is from the Lord. Uh, but then he'll come back to, you know, I, not the Lord. Um, and here that's that's not... That's not the case. Uh, he doesn't make a, a distinction that this is just coming from me for you, Corinthians, at this time with what you're, you got going on. Uh, I, not the Lord, say this. Um, he doesn't say not the Lord says this here. So that's that's where I would say that this is coming from God uh, and not just uh, Paul's opinion on a particular matter for a particular time. Okay. Other thoughts on women in the ministry, pastoral ministry. Do you think the Catholics will uh, cave to women priests? At have, some time. I actually just heard this week that was um, a debate. I just heard that this week. Oh, yeah. That Seemed like the Pope said something, but then the clergy came out and then came back and said, well, no, we're not really going to do that. But the Pope said something like, well, there's there's room for uh, movement. And then the clergy came back and said that there they were not. <laughs> yeah. There was not. Yeah, there's been a lot of noise uh, there. There's been a lot of noise in the, the Missouri Synod uh, here recently. Um, if if the Pope sneezes, uh, all of Christendom catches a cold. So um, there's been a lot of noise about the Roman Church, and so there's been a lot of noise in it uh, in every uh, denomination that does not. Um, it, we're usually the last to catch a cold, um, but it. I mean, it 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 keeps coming up. Uh, I don't. I don't know if they if they will or or will not, um, but. The good news uh, is that the Lord knows uh, those who are his own. Uh, and even like you mentioned this this book, and some of them are great preachers, um, and God be praised uh, that the, the gospel is getting out. Uh, and so you know, we, we would want to talk against something that's clearly against scripture. Um, but God's going to keep getting his uh, sheep uh, taken care of and brought in. Right? And he's only got broken pieces to make use of. And so from uh, our perspective, it's always going to look a bit of a mess. And we don't want to accept that mess and just say, well, you know, whatever. Um, we want to be faithful to the scriptures. But then we also see okay, you know, she baptized a baby. Does that, does that work? Yeah, because it doesn't depend on her. And she said that, you know, Jesus died for the sins of the world. Does the Holy Spirit work with that? Yeah. Well, Paul says, you know, there's those who are clearly preaching, not because they love the message, but in order to create problems for him. And he says, fine. You know, all that matters is that Christ is preached. Uh, and in that I rejoice. Uh, even if they're only doing it for terrible, uh, from their terrible motivation to create problems, spirit still is going to be at at work, and it's still going to create faith, and we get to rejoice in it. Um, but you know, like this says, though, it says um, faith comes from hearing the message. 
and uh, as long as they're preaching for Christ to crucify, his word will not return to an empty. So it is in, you know. Yeah. I'm not saying ideal, but it's still his word being preached. Yeah. So there's there's the good news in, in all of the mass. I mean, we, if we look at any denomination, we look at uh, any congregation, we look at any individual Christian, any individual preacher, like none of it's great. You know, it's all kind of, well, gosh, it's not exactly the way it's supposed to be. Uh, and that that this problem is not a problem that we currently have doesn't mean that we're doing everything 100% perfect and never making any mistakes. Thankfully, the Holy Spirit is able to uh, work uh, in spite of us uh, and not with it all depending on us. Um, it's been uh, in a, a book club thing these last few weeks um, going through going through a Roman Catholic book on uh, on women called uh, the the privilege the privilege of being a woman. Um, only woman. In the, I was the only guy in the. I, did, I thought it was real. Thought someone else. Would. Um, but because these are key things, the stuff I talked about at the beginning of class uh, with with Mary, uh, and the, the direction that we, we seem to be going, um, it seemed important for me to uh, study some of those things. Uh, some of the really good things that came out of that that book are highlighting. Uh, the things uh, that are a privilege of uh, that for the for women that our world, which is uh, you know theologians of glory, will downplay. You know, submission, servanthood, uh, silence, um, veils, and things like that that we've talked about from time to time. Uh, that's there in scripture. Um, what do you cover in scripture? What is holy? What is sacred? Um, and so when Paul says that women should be covered uh, in church, uh, there that's one of those I not the Lord. It's not that it has to happen for us now, but that's not a demeaning thing. Uh, the tabernacle uh, is a covering. It's a veil of the divine. I will make a helper suitable for him. It's a Hebrew word used of the woman and of God. It was a divine thing. Uh, and it's the way that Jesus talks. You know, the first will be last and the last will be first. Uh, that our world doesn't see that. Our, our world says the first will be first. And you don't want to be last. Uh, that you should be the boss, not the servant. You should make the decisions, uh, not follow. Um. Jesus turns all that upside down for men and for women. And when there's sections like this, at the cross, we see that this is beautiful. Um, because there, everything gets turned upside down. Uh, the one who made everything becomes the lowest, becomes our sin. The Holy One is crushed. Right? And this is the one that we get to follow. We don't want to be world beaters who are in charge of everything. If you're going to be a leader, you have to be servant. If you're going to be first, you have to be last. The highest is the one who became the lowest. And those are the things that are usually missed in the discussions of battle between the sexes and things like that. Okay, that generates questions, I'm sure. Oh, we've got yellow uh, sheets. You can write them down um, if you would like to. Uh, and we'll uh, pick up on page 34 next week. Taught by our Lord and trusting his promises, we are bold to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Have a wonderful week. Drive safe tonight.